Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Nursing Insights Podcast. My name is Stephanie, and I'm a registered nurse practicing in the state of New Jersey. Getting right to it, the state of healthcare right now is tough, to say the least. Let's just say that the nursing shortage does not spark joy. We can sit in that and stew in it for a while, but we can't live in it forever. Things are changing. So join me as your host as I partner with the New Jersey Collaborating Center for Nursing to hear from nurses across the state about their experiences, trials, and triumphs in the nursing profession. Today on Nursing Insights, we have Carmen Zalto, Director of Nursing at a New Jersey Assisted Living Facility. She also has her certification in Assisted Living Administration. Carmen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Carmen, could you tell us just a bit about your nursing career? So I became a licensed practical nurse, started nursing school at 18 years old. It was a year-long program, and I became an LPN. And back in that time, which was three decades ago, we went right into the hospital to work. It was just something that you did. You went right to the hospital and started your your career there. And I did the typical path of going to med surge. So my med surge experience actually lasted 20 years. So I stayed in the hospital for 20 years, honestly thought I was going to retire in the hospital. As things evolved with managed care, there were other opportunities that I wanted to explore. So after 20 to 22 years, I started doing per diem home care. And then I enjoyed that. I was also on the night shift trying to raise a family. And as the kids got older, it got a little bit harder to maintain the night shift and maintain being a full-time mom. So eventually I switched my life over and went to home care full-time and then switched to hospital per diem. So the company that I was working with, it was the position was called a field nurse supervisor. So I did that for a couple of years. And then a position opened up to be a nursing director in home care. So I did that for about five to seven more years. And then a position opened up within my company where I was working in home care. They also own an assisted living and an opportunity opened there to become the director of nursing at my assisted living community, which is where I am now. Absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing. Before we get into the assisted living part, which is clearly now where you are in a beautiful mm-hmm. part of nursing, I'd love to just hear just for a second, you were in med surge for 20 years. What was it that you loved that kept you there? So with med surge, there's medical and there's surgical. So it was just a very good learning opportunity opportunity where you get to understand the dynamics of the disease and then treatments. And then being able to do follow-ups if you're working back-to-back days, or even in my case, evenings, you would just be able to see the progression of treatment plans and with the surgicals, having them have the surgery, be pre-op and send them home. So there's a lot of learning opportunity in med search. And do you feel that even now in your position in home mm-hmm. care and in now into assisted living, mm-hmm. Were you able to take a lot of your learnings from MedSurge and just bring them through across your career? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. So just one more vote toward MedSurge. I'm a MedSurge nurse as well. So I, <laughs> I love MedSurge. I love I love MedSurge too. You followed the positions as they opened, but also mm-hmm. assisted living is its own community. It has its own culture within mm-hmm. the nursing space. Could you tell us a little bit about why you chose to work in assisted living while other opportunities I'm sure were there too? Yes. Okay. So when I became the field nurse supervisor in home care, there was the component where I was seeing patients every day. Then I became the nursing director where it became more of an administrative role. I started missing seeing patients, residents, clients, whichever avenue, everybody calls it a different thing. In home care, it's clients. In the hospital, it's patients. In assisted living, it's residents. So while I enjoyed the leadership position, I missed being a part of patient care. So when the opportunity opened up in assisted living, I felt like it was the best of both worlds. I still had the administrative position, but I was able to see them every day and be a part of their clinical needs and just a part of their world every day. So I thought it was the perfect position for me when it opened up. So for our listeners who maybe never experienced assisted living, would you be able to just walk us through the day in the life of a director of nursing at an assisted living facility? Sure. So my morning starts where I come in the building and when I'm coming in, in in my particular community, I have to walk past the dining room to my office. So every morning I make a point of, and I'm walking, when I'm walking through, it's breakfast time. So every morning I make a point of saying hello to every single resident individually and saying good morning to them. So I know every single residence, I know all of their names, I know all of their families, and I make sure I know all the employees as well. So assisted living is just that. It's assisted living. It's not a skilled nursing facility. This is where people come to live, and our community is a beautiful community that has apartments, and they come here and they need some assistance, not 
full assistance. So this is just something that I think there is a lack of knowledge out there to, I guess, everybody that's not involved in assisted living. This is not a pretty nursing home. It is somewhere where residents come to live. I have some residents that still drive. So that's how independent they are. Basically, the day-to-day -day for me looks like I come in, I speak with my nurses, I get report, I see what is needed. Our assisted living has a lot of activities going on. We just had a wedding about an hour ago. Wonderful. So the residents got married. <laughs> so How um, it's, it's just, I, I don't want any new nurse or any potential student nurse to rule out assisted living. It is just such an, a, a wonderful, amazing community to work in. And as you were saying that not everybody really knows the scope of what assisted living is compared mm -hmm. to other areas of care. Could you explain to our listeners the difference between assisted living and long-term care? So long-term care is more along the lines of a nursing home. Those type of residents require more hands-on care to complete their activities of daily living. In the interest of transparency, we don't have the staffing ratios that a SNF, which is a skilled nursing facility or long-term care would have. You know, our ratios look very different. We have a memory care unit, and most assisted livings do. Some assisted livings have independent living. Our particular community doesn't have that, but our community is assisted living plus memory care, and we treat them with two separate entities. The memory care does have higher acuity residents because of their cognitive needs, and assisted living is, like I said, I have some residents that still drive. You know, they need very minimal hands-on care, but they are here because they just recognize that living at home was no longer feasible for them. In assisted living, most of the residents are on a medication program, which is what we do here, I would say about 10% of our residents are self-medicators and the remainder of them are on the medication program. So basically when a resident moves in, it's a transition, but I treat it as a happy experience. What I say to them is you never have to cook again. You never have to worry about your medication and you never have to worry about laundry. All you have to do is come here and live out your best life. What an awesome experience for your mm -hmm. residents mm -hmm. and, and what a supportive environment. And I'm sure for many families, it's just so reassuring to know that that there is a nurse on staff. Even if they're independent mm -hmm. in many of their mm -hmm. activities of daily living, they have that option to be able to say, oh, you know, maybe mom or dad is, you know, struggling with their medication or maybe mm -hmm. mom or dad has been having some changes recently. So in a facility like yours where the director of nursing is stopping by every day and can really see the changes in the family members who are living and residing there, it's such a relief, I'm sure, for so many of your residents and their families. Would you be able to share with us a little bit about the nursing skill that you use while there, while they're as the uh, DON. So I am responsible for all the assessments of the potential move-ins. So it is a clinical assessment, but it is also a psychosocial assessment. So aside from doing the review of systems, what I also like to do, and this is something that I share with all of our department heads because everybody can benefit from the information, I really delve into who the person was prior to the move-in. So I will ask them, what did you do for a living? Are you married? Are you divorced? How many children do you have? How many grandchildren do you have? What do you like to do for fun? So all of this information is extremely important to help them transition into a whole different lifestyle. So I will get all this information from them and I do a nice write-up. I call it a summary. So it's a summary of Joan Smith or you know John Dow moving in and every single department head gets a copy of it. And then they do it, they take it and supply it to their own staff so that we are prepared for the resident move-in. So it will go to activities, it will go to dietary, it will go to concierge, it will go to maintenance. So everybody gets the same report. And then there's a piece of, in the report for everybody just so that they understand the new resident that's moving in. So we could really individualize and make the care specific to them. If there is a unique hobby that they like, the activities director will hone in on that. And maybe we can introduce a new activity just to make this resident comfortable. That's phenomenal. And I love how you were able to kind of pull apart some of the different departments that you work with. Because mm -hmm. obviously in the assisted living facility, the departments you're working with in collaboration to care mm -hmm. for your residents are going to look different than that, which you may find in a hospital setting. But I'm sure still some of the staff would overlap. Do you still get a chance to work with dietary, with mm -hmm. PT, with OT? Could you tell us about those collaborations? Sure. So when a resident moves in, we do want to know if they would benefit from any physical therapy. A lot of times we have residents moving in from at home, and the reason they're moving in is because they're no longer suitable to live at home. So I will request a PT evaluation, and we collaborate with 
outside providers, which would be PT, OT, and if needed down the line, or maybe they're moving in for this specific reason, we will also collaborate with hospice. Um, we also have services that we can bring to the community. This isn't unique to us. I believe it's other assisted livings as well, but we could bring dental here, ear doctor, eye doctor, foot doctor, psychology, psychiatry. So all of these can be a part of the AL experience where they, they don't have to leave the building for. Yes. And what an opportunity for people to be able to have all of those services mm -hmm. come directly to them. So for nurses that might be considering a DON position or moving into the assisted living facility space, would you have any recommendations for how to develop the skills and the abilities that would make them successful in assisted living? I'm old school. I, I understand and recognize that nurses no longer have to run right to the hospital like I did to get that med surge experience. However, having said that, some type of clinical experience is beneficial to have in the assisted living. And the reason for that is because these nurses are more so autonomous with their decision making because the, the doctor isn't here. We do have a medical director. We do have a few physicians and providers that come on site, but they're not here every day. So the nurses sometimes have to make clinical decisions based based on what the presentation is of the resident as to whether or not we're going to react clinically. So I do think that having some kind of clinical background is very important prior to coming into assisted living. And that makes sense. As you're saying, your nurses are much more independent because there's not a doctor on site. So mm -hmm. that clinical background, that acumen is so important to be able to take good care of your residents. Could you tell us some stories about a rewarding experience you may have had working with seniors in assisted living? Honestly, every day that I come to work is rewarding for me. Like I said, I am a clinical nurse through and through. So when I went to the home care administrative position, sitting in an office at the time was enjoyable, but I started missing seeing residents every day. So I also didn't want to go back into the throes of the hospital post COVID. So being in assisted living, seeing residents every day, but they are people who aren't critically ill, it, this is just like a perfect balance. You're here every day. We get to become a part of their lives. Quite frankly, I'm spending more waking hours here than I am at home with my own family at this point. So they're my family and they treat me as if I'm their family. So I just think every day that I come in is, is rewarding to, that I get to spend the day with residents and seniors and be a part of their lives. They chose us. They could have opted to try and stay home with a caregiver. They chose to come here. And I want to make sure that their final place where they live is an enjoyable experience for them. Beautiful. And with all of the positives, of course, just like everywhere else in the world, there are some challenges. What are some of the challenges that you as a nurse experience or mm -hmm. face within assisted living? So I always say that I would love to have been in assisted living 20 years ago because the assisted living 20 years ago is very different from the assisted living now. Residents are moving in at an older age. Some of the residents are moving in at their late 90s. They have way more comorbidities. They have a higher need for their clinical needs, higher need for their ADLs. And we have to have a healthy balance between recognizing if assisted living is appropriate and realistic expectations of when it's not appropriate to move into assisted living. And this just goes back to when I was talking about the staffing ratios. This is not just, it's not a nursing home. It's not a pretty nursing home. Sometimes, unfortunately, residents that would like to move in, their clinical needs exceed what we as an assisted living can safely provide. So these are the challenges that I believe every assisted living is meeting. Yes, that makes sense. And your assessment becomes such a critical part of that mm -hmm. because it gives you the leverage with which to say, these are your capabilities for what you can mm -hmm. provide. And this is what the resident or potential resident may need. And that match is so important mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. safety of the resident and also for your staff and for the fellow residents at mm -hmm. the assisted living. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about your memory care unit and how you function as a nurse specifically within that realm? Okay. So our memory care unit is a locked unit. The staff up on our memory care, they only work the memory care. And when we interview staff. We want to make sure that it is individuals that are comfortable and passionate about dementia. If they are not comfortable and passionate about dementia, then it's not an area that they should be working. Those residents are the most vulnerable in the building. And we want to make sure that the staff is on board and understanding the challenges of caring for dementia-specific residents where behaviors may come into play, especially for the, the two to 10 shifts. And we want to make sure that they have the appropriate training, the appropriate coping skills, they understand de-escalation. So 
we do hire staff that has a background and we do also train. But when a staff member says, listen, I'm really just not comfortable with behaviors, maybe the assisted living is a better place for me. So we, we do segregate that way. My memory care unit, the staff is a very close knit family because they do deal with challenges that are specific to that unit. So really your job as a director of nursing has so many aspects to it. There's the clinical aspect, of course, of being able to do the accurate assessment mm -hmm. and be able to understand the needs of your potential residents and your current residents. And then there's also that administrative side, which mm -hmm. I know can be a little bit challenging for nurses to transition because if you've been at your bedside the whole career, and then you're now transitioning into this leadership role, this role that takes into account these other aspects such as staffing and shift scheduling, all of those mm -hmm. new elements can be really tough for nurses to transition into competence for. How is it that you were able to transition or what helped you in your transition into a leadership in nursing? I had good mentors. They showed me how to de-escalate situations, how to listen, proper communication. And I do believe this is something that I learned over time. I want to say that I, I'm growing as a leader and I continue to grow and learn every day. So it's just a mindset that you have to be humble. You have to learn how to listen. You have to listen to listen, not listen to respond. And that's something that maybe it just takes time and experience to learn. You know, so I've, I've, I think I've grown as a leader. I continue to grow. I will learn more tomorrow and just coming into work every day and understanding that I, I learn from my employees, the ones that I hired. I like to hire people that are going to help me grow. And I want them to grow as well. What a way for a leader to function. I mean, of course, you're going to be able to have great connection with your staff, great connection with your residents when you come in with that humility and that desire to be a team and to be a family, as you're saying, rather than just a leader setting a course and then stepping back. Is there anything else that you really want to be able to share about working with seniors, working in the assisted living space or working with memory care residents? Well, I want future em candidates for employees to really consider assisted living as a career path. Charlie and I have talked about this frequently where we learned, and even for me, I, so I went to nursing school twice. I went to LPN school and then I went to RN school. We did not rotate in assisted living. We rotated in every other specialty, but assisted living wasn't even a, a rotation. And even when I worked in the hospital, I was not aware of the differentials between assisted living versus long-term care or nursing home. To me, back at at that time, everything was a nursing home. A long-term care was a nursing home. Assisted living didn't even exist and I didn't even think about it. So it's definitely a rewarding experience. It's having clinicals without having to do a lot of clinical. We we don't do wound care. We don't have catheters. Well, we do have catheters, but we don't have heavy duty clinical tasks that we have to do. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. What happens is we get a lot of former nursing home employees come here because they felt like the nursing homes were too much for them. So they come here and it's just like a little bit more of a relaxed setting for them. But I feel like it's really not put out there in the nursing schools or any other, you know, the CNA programs or the med tech programs to try assisted living. You know, you can find a home here. In the assisted living setting in which you're a nursing director, would you be able to tell us about who are some of the colleagues that you're working with and what are the roles clinically that you have? Okay, so the wellness department consists of about 80 employees. So we have our LPNs and I separated the departments. So there was one nurse assigned to our memory care for mornings and evenings. And then there was one nurse assigned to assisted living for mornings and evenings. So those are LPNs. Then we have our caregivers, which are the home health aides or CNAs that are providing the hands-on care. Then we have our certified medication techs. So these are home health aides that are duly certified where they are home health aides, but they also are certified medication techs. So medication aides have to have their CHHA license. They can't just be a medication aide without having that dual license. So they are on our carts providing medication. And this is basically, that is a full-time job. So that's basically, they can do hands-on care, but it is a full-time position to do medications for our morning and evening shifts. So that is the wellness department. I know for folks who are coming from the hospital realm of nursing, medication mm -hmm. aids are something different because I believe mm -hmm. that medication aids are only within the assisted living space. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think they're only in assisted living. Yes. And there is a shortage. There's a, a massive shortage of medication techs. And medication techs work under the license of the director of nursing. Is that also correct? Yes. 
Yeah, so I'm sure that also has another aspect in your role of keeping your medication mm -hmm. techs up to date with their knowledge and their training so that they're yes. able to administer safely. Yes, 100%. We do quarterly evaluations of the med techs, which is basically a review of the five rights. We also pick a medication of the month just to review a particular medication for best practices. I'll find something that maybe in, in the past there's been some challenges with, such as tapering steroids. Also, during the COVID outbreak, the, the medication was very specific. It was a new med, so we reviewed COVID meds, but I'll pick one medication per month and just review it with them. In your assisted living facility, you're the only one with the RN license as you work mostly with LPNs and with bed techs and with caregivers. Mm -hmm. At the same time, our nurses are used to being part of a community. Where is it that you find community with other nurses aside from the ones that you're working with? So funny enough, uh, my RN school, we just had our reunion. My our, It was our 25-year reunion. Oh, God, I can't believe I just said that. But, um, okay. you know, it was good to get back to my nursing school and just see where everybody's at. And some of them became NPs. Some of them are at the bedside and some of them went on for continuing education. But we do have a nice little group that we stay in touch periodically the healthcare association is another another avenue. And then I just like to stay in touch with some DONs from other communities. We kind of troubleshoot off each other. We're all here to help each other. You know, we all want what's best for our residents and our clients and our patients. So I do stay in touch with some local DONs. Some of our residents do go to rehabs. So I do stay in touch with those DONs. And just if I have something that I just want to run by them that I'm not sure about, I'll text them and they text me back also with some questions. And as you've alluded to, assisted living as a care realm is also evolving. You said 20 years ago, assisted living looks different than it does today. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure being in touch with those other DONs also keeps you abreast of the conversations of where assisted living is and where it continues to go. Do you have any thoughts about where you think assisted living will be in the next 5, 10, 15 years? So aging in place looks very different than aging in place 20 years ago. Having said that, our age range here is from 62 years old to 102. So that's our age range. We have a 40 year age range here. But as I said, it seems that people are moving in as people are living longer, they're pausing on moving into the assisted living. So sometimes we end up identifying clinical areas that they were not aware of because they maybe weren't getting proper clinical care. So there is definitely challenges to having individuals move in older, but you know, I, we're up for the challenge here. And I'm sure most of the nurses that are dedicated to it certainly are aware and ready for it. So what does collaboration look like between your staff, your nurses, and the physicians that come to serve with your patients? So they are wellness visits. And we want to make sure when the medical director or one of the other providers is here that the residents are getting their needs addressed without overstepping Whereas they're getting into the habit of seeing the doctor too much out of convenience. That you know, we sense. talk, yes. I mean, we, we can treat symptomology if we have standing orders without having to contact the doctor too much. And we've had to, you know, ex explain that to residents, you know, if you were actually living at home independently, you wouldn't see your doctor for every little sniffle or cold. So we do have standing orders for you. And we just kind of, kind of want to use that. You know, we want to use that as, you know, to promote wellness and just to make sure that we're not overreaching. And for a behind the scenes look for some of mm -hmm. our listeners who may be looking into or understanding assisted living better, mm -hmm. if you have a resident, let's say you're having a resident who's progressing with their symptoms and maybe some of your staff members have noticed it and there's the consideration for wanting to go into a reassessment and continue evaluating if they require mm -hmm. more care or different care. What does that look like on the assisted living staff and physician collaboration side? Okay, so in assisted living, a resident is reassessed every six months or as needed. So I rely heavily on the caregivers to tell me, they're, as they're the ones that are providing the care every single day and they spend the most time with the residents, that John Smith, they've noticed a decline and they've noticed that they're not doing as much independently as they previously were. So I give the caregiver the opportunity to, to tell me how consistent has this been? Did you just notice it yesterday or has it been going on for a week or two? So at that point, what we will do is we will reevaluate 
and I will loop in the family as needed. And if we notice that it is consistent where aging in place, you know, as will cause a decline in health eventually, I do loop in the family to let them know, just to say to them, listen, we have noticed that mom or dad is requiring more hands-on care in order to safely have their ADLs done, or, you know, we don't want falls to happen. So we're going to increase the care by one level. And it's, it's a discussion. It's definitely a discussion that we have to have with the family prior to it happening, just to give them the heads up, but it's really all about remaining safe in the community. And you had mentioned that hospice sometimes comes into play mm -hmm. yes. because of the aspect of aging in mm -hmm. place. Yes. What does it look like for a resident who is now transitioned into hospice care? And what does that collaboration and that dialogue look like? So first and foremost, we do have to talk about families because there is the preconceived notion about hospice. I've had residents on hospice for months and months, and I've had residents graduate off of hospice. Hospice doesn't automatically mean that they're terminal acutely. So what I explain to families is it's an extra level of support that is provided by an outside vendor at no cost to them that is collaborative efforts with our community. And for the resident themselves, what does that tend to look like? More frequent check-ins or maybe a one-to-one -one yes. aid? Yes. So the nurse will come in and do the evaluation and then they will come in a few times a week. They start doing their daily visits when they realize that the, the resident is transitioning. They will send an aid and then they have their the medications and the medications, we may never utilize them. It's a comfort kit. It is standard and we only utilize them if they are needed. We don't automatically just start putting residents on medication unnecessarily. Of course, safety still being number one mm -hmm. paramount. Yes. And would there be any other areas in which you would want to share how assisted living is different from other areas of care or other types of nursing practice? So I can bring up that we talked earlier about collaborated efforts with physical therapy. So what we do here, I'm not sure if other communities do it, they might. Physical therapy, we're at the mercy of Medicare. So once Medicare cuts off, then it just cuts off. What we have done is we started a restorative care aid program. So physical therapy will end and then we hired a restorative care aide who continues to work with residents to promote their mobility and their locomotion. So it's very important to keep residents mobile. It helps with safety. It helps with fall prevention. And it's worked out very well here. It really seems that one of the greatest differences between being a practicing nurse as a DON in an assisted living facility in comparison to being a nurse perhaps in an acute care setting or other setting is just the level of detail that you have and involvement in each individual resident's daily lives and their care and their promotion of health wherever they are on the spectrum. What are some of the skills or qualities or even personality traits that you think make a DON successful in an assisted living facility? That's a good question. I think having the ability to listen, having the ability to be sympathetic, having the ability to understand there are multiple family dynamics. I have residents that live here that have no family to residents that live here that have 10 children. So it's all over the spectrum with what the backgrounds of our residents look like. So just, again, having the understanding, being humble, you know, we've all, you, I'm sure you've worked with DONs. I've had great DONs and I've had some not so great DONs. And I appreciated those experiences because I learned that that's how I don't want to be. So I wanted to make sure that I was going to be a compassionate and understanding and humble and communicative DON that my door is always open, even for my staff. I want my staff to know that they could always come to me. No question is a, a silly question. And I've made mistakes. Anybody can make a, a mistake. What they have to do is learn from their mistakes. Having a conversation with me about corrective actions is not a discipline. It's more of a learning experience. These are things that I've learned. And like I said, it took me, you know, a while to get to these leadership skills. I think it, you know, it evolves over time, but these are important traits that I think DONs should have compassionate, understanding, proper communication, sympathy, and empathy. And being such a wonderfully involved DON, I know that you have amazing stories and amazing interactions with your residents. Could you tell us just one story of a time you were able to make a difference in the life of a patient or a staff member? Sure. Okay. So I had in home care. So as I told you, we do have a home care agency. So I did have a home care client, and then I moved over to the assisted living. So the daughter of this 
client said it was time to put dad into assisted living. And she said to me, Carmen, knowing that you were over at this community, this is the only community that I want my dad at. So she did move her dad in. Unfortunately, he passed away relatively quickly, but she was very thankful for the experience and knowing that I, I was overseeing the care and having my staff, who I am very confident in, oversee the care. And she actually, believe it or not, just texted me a few days ago, just checking in on me. So that was a very nice experience. But I have a lot of stories like that. And my, and my residents are great. I mean, nursing is truly a passion and it's something that I thoroughly enjoy. We always ask this of our nurses who come on the podcast. How do you take care of yourself through the, <laughs> the ups and downs, the trials and challenges and triumphs as a nurse? How do you mm -hmm. take care of yourself? I guess just learning the ability, and I do have a hard time with this, just turning off sometimes, spending time with my family. Um, I do love the summer. So I just like taking time to just sit and enjoy the sun and enjoy just spending time with friends when I can. Not talking about nursing and not talking about work, you know, is, is something that just so your brain just shuts off. I mean, that is very important. It's something that I'm still learning to do. I am very connected to my community out of choice. But I do recognize that there, there is, you know, a need for being able to shut off at times. Exercising, I do like kickboxing. I do, believe it or not, I do have a desire to go to do archery. So I, there is like a local archery place that oh, I'm cool. going to get to very soon in the fall. But yeah, these are just fun, you know, things that we should all do for ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Carmen, for taking the time to spend sharing your wisdom and your insights and your experiences with us. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on the Nursing Insights Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the New Jersey Collaborating Center for Nursing and the Rutgers School of Communication and Information.